Thanks so much. I'm going to ask my speakers to come up as I, as I open remarks. I, we just heard a fascinating conversation about how technology and innovation is going to push human performance. And I think that everyone here is as excited as I am about what the possibilities are. Just thinking about the kin 15 years from now and how we're all going to be in thermally controlled rompers, that's very exciting. <laughs> Because I thought, the first thing I thought of was, it'll help me through my hot flashes. And then I realized 15 years from now, I ain't going to have any hot flashes. Um, but no, I am joined here on the stage today by two incredible experts to talk about um, something that's equally, if not more important than the topic we just talked about, and that is wellness. You know, we've spent the last two days um, discussing some phenomenal innovations that we are going to be seeing. We spent time talking about the responsibilities that we have as leaders of corporations, not-for-profits, military, academics, about how we're going to push these boundaries. But none of this is going to be able to be possible if we are not taking care of ourselves. As somebody who grew up in an in a immigrant family with parents from China, I was brought up with the notion that health is more about what you do to take care of yourself day to day than the curative approach that exists in the West. So the East approach is very different than the West. And I am really happy to see that this is becoming a topic that is happening in rooms like today. So I'm joined today by David Sella, who is a faculty member here at Northwestern. He's chair and professor of medical social services. Welcome, David. And Darshak Sangavi, who is a returning Kenyan. Um, who is Chief Medical Officer of Optum Labs and former senior health official for the Obama administration. So we have a very good representation of um, both academic and practical, you know, out there um, talking, to, talking to all kinds of different people, both of these gentlemen do, about the latest and greatest in wellness. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to frame our conversation in two parts. Um, the first part is about wellness of ourself and the second about the topic of wellness for an organization, because a lot of people here lead organizations. So let's talk about wellness for ourselves. As, as we know, if you travel on airplanes, they always say, if the oxygen mask comes down, you've got to put the mask on yourself first before you help someone else. So let's start with ourselves. And I would love to chat a little bit. Um, why, why don't you both just give me some thoughts about the fact that there's so much out there today that's telling us about how healthy we are. We're wearing stuff, we're hooked to stuff, you know, we're going to have these Google eyeballs in a few years. Um, tell me about the impact of data on how well you think people are taking care of themselves. Darshak, me first. Sure. So I think that um, the interesting thing about data is that we have a lot of it. But what I would love to see is do we actually follow the data about the data? So let's take Fitbits, for example. Like a lot of people here are aware that Oh, Al Landry's got a Fitbit. He's yeah. been trying to convince me to get one. Excellent. It actually, so you, the idea is, that, yeah, you know, you look at your 10,000 steps and you've got enough exercise. Many of you may or may not be aware that in last year, there's a randomized control study published in JAMA, a uh, top-tier medical journal performed by research at the University of Pittsburgh. If you actually wear a Fitbit, you will gain weight. Ooh, many people don't realize that. that Why would that happen? That explains it. Well, no, I'm sorry, I said gain weight, but you actually lose weight at a lower rate compared to people who don't have one. They're trying oh, to lose okay. weight if you're overweight. And the reason is that people didn't know what to do with the information. They said 10,000 steps, oh, I'm exercising. It turns out they ate more than they should have, so they actually were increasing their caloric load. Oh. We see those types of examples throughout medicine. Fetal heart monitoring increases rates of cesarean sections, actually um, worsens outcomes in many ways, has not significantly reduced the rate of, for example, kids born with cerebral palsy. Which so is it gives people a false sense of security or something? It actually, well, it encourages you to take actions that are harmful, which is oh. to do stat cesarean sections when they're not. The other example, prostate-specific antigen, PSA testing in it. So I think there's a sort of notion that more data is better, but I'd encourage us to realize that we, it has to be evidence-based, and so we have to look at it. So when we talk about wellness, and I, this is sort of the thought that animates a lot of the work I've done in the administration and even now, that I think it should be, wellness is another, it's like a nice way of saying prevention. And when we talk about prevention, let's be data-driven. What exactly is it that we want to prevent? So we should be aware of what are the major health issues. Heart attack, stroke, dementia, back pain, opiate use disorder, HIV. 
let's sort of think about those and then from those work our way back to what are those wellness strategies that are highest yield to prevent them. I'll close with one last example, which is that wellness, we talk about taking care of ourselves. It's very, very hard to do that. It's very hard to think about all the things you should do. An example is birth defects. We know that you should take a prenatal vitamin to prevent them. It turns out that if you are um, pregnant, you know, that's when you go to the doctor, you're like, oh, I'll start taking a prenatal vitamin. It's already too late. Because most pregnancies are unplanned. By the time you find out you're pregnant, you already, your, your child's brain and heart have started to form. I'm a pediatric cardiologist, so we see this. How do you prevent it? Well, so the CDC came out and said that you should all take a, a prenatal vitamin, which actually any vitamin is okay. Like Flintstones is fine. You just need the folic acid. <laughs> You, but you should take them if you are a woman of childbearing age. Every woman should be on a daily multivitamin. Many people don't do that. So how do we address it? We just started adding it to flour. And then we realized there are disparities because many Latino individuals and others, they're going gluten-free or they don't like, so now it's added to corn flour. And this has substantially reduced the rate of birth defects. So I would encourage us to think, again, following the data about the data and then acting on it both at the individual but then potentially at the societal level are very important. Great, thanks. David. Yeah, excellent points. I, I, you know, if you look at disease and what causes disease, more than half of diseases that we face today in our modernized, you know, society are are uh, rooted in behavior, uh, whether that's uh, addiction-related behaviors of uh, tobacco use or alcohol or diet-related behaviors. We're an extremely overweight nation, uh, and uh, and getting more so, uh, or or high-risk behaviors, you know, with accidents, particularly in younger uh, in younger people. So um, behavior is a, is a huge problem. And as I was listening to this morning's uh, talks, which were fantastic, I, you know, I just came to appreciate uh, even more than you know, what I've always thought in concept, that technology is so far ahead of human behavior. Uh, and I guess the, the way to be a successful technology company is to figure out what humans need and want before they know they need and want it. Um, and uh, and, and, and that's, that's a real trick. But by and large, when it comes to health, behavior is lagging way behind, and and the healthcare system is frankly not doing a good job of of of, of addressing, you know, the health behavior related problems in terms of uh, onset of disease and then treatment of disease once once it's uh, come on, whether that's cancer or heart disease or diabetes, which is at, at epidemic proportions um, in the country today. But I want to, you know, speaking of individual wellness, because you started on that on that topic of you know wellness for the person, I just want to you know engage you all a little bit in a, in a in your own thought experiment now. And I have the answer, so uh, uh, don't, don't worry. You'll, you'll get it at the end. But I want you to think in terms of physical health and mental health as, as two things in balance, right? Because health isn't just how we feel physically. Health is how we're doing mentally and socially and you know, for some spiritually uh, and having a sense of purpose. So when you consider all of the aspects of physical, mental, and social health, what is the age? That, and this is global, this is international, not just US, but what do you think is the age where we're our healthiest? On balance. Close your eyes, think is it somewhere in your 20s or your teens or your 40s or your 80s? Yeah, so interesting. I hear a lot of 50s and 60s and, and, and indeed that is the answer. Um, it's 62. I happen to be 62 right now. <laughs> So I mean, I'm the picture of wellness. Uh, not really. <laughs> I've, got my, I've got my pain, too. <laughs> um, but uh, 62. And, and the reason for that is, we're, you know, at 62, you're not quite old enough to have many of the, of the diseases that come with your cardiovascular disease and cancer, if you've managed to escape those. And, and most by 62 have, but by 72, that's not the case. And there is this paradoxical increase that comes with with age and with time and with experience of improving well-being, both mental well-being and social well-being. Um, and a theory about that uh, by uh, Laura Carstensen at uh, Stanford is that this relates to something called socio-emotional selectivity. Uh, socio-emotional selectivity is the idea that when you're young, you think you've got to put up with a lot of crap because you're trying to get something accomplished. So you can have a nasty boss, or you can have a, you know, an abusive friend you know, who never says the right thing, and yet you're in that clique of friends, and so you put up with it and you tolerate it, and you're not very happy about it. So you're under a kind of a stress, and you don't have a great sense of well-being. But as we age, we start being more and more able to say, you know what, I don't, I'm getting too old for this, or I don't have to deal with this anymore. So to those of you who are young in the audience, there's hope for all the things you're putting up with now. 
you'll reach an age where you can say, I don't have to deal with this anymore. And that's, a, that's another version of wellness. You know, there's the physical side, which, you know, unfortunately, you know, degrades naturally in, in most of us over time. But on the mental and, and social sides, uh, there is room for improvement. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. I, um, I'm a real believer that stress is one of the greatest contributors to health issues, wellness issues. Mm -hmm. um, having lived through quite a few years of caregiving for parents, um, I know what that does. I mean, this, you know, I, was, I wasn't that old and I was dealing with a lot of stress mm -hmm. between parents and children and all that. You, you go through an awful lot and I know that the toll that that can take on you. Let's move to organizations. The majority of people, or many people in this, in this room, if not everyone, impacts large organizations, um, whether directly or indirectly. If we are leading organizations, what are some of the things you believe leaders should do to ensure a healthy organization? The cost of resources and time for people who are not well is, is hundreds of millions of dollars across this country. Mm -hmm. So what's some advice you can give to organizational leaders? Right. Well, I'd say certainly the incentive is already there. As we talked about, even global competitiveness for companies depends a great deal on the amount you're spending on healthcare costs. So when we talk about wellness, I think the way to frame that in ways that are most meaningful is what is your company's healthcare spend? What is the lack of productivity and all that that's lost? So there clearly is a strong driving incentive. What I would say about wellness is that there's, a, there's sort of a, a trap that we could fall into, which is that the the, the way to address this problem is to increasingly push responsibility on the employee, meaning that high deductible health plans, you know, we're going to lower health care costs, going to empower them. We're going to give them apps so that they can um, take better care of themselves, eat better. We're going to reorganize our cafeteria, go to standing desks, and so forth. What we know based on the data is that while that is an attractive way of thinking about what might make a difference, that is unlikely to substantially actually really improve health quite a bit. Um, so I think it's important, again, following the data about the data. What I think is going to be increasingly true is that we have to be very sophisticated about building in strategies that encourage health without people having to think about it. And that's really getting into the weeds. It's about benefit design. It's like, how do you actually encourage people to get the preventive care? If they then get it, how do you make sure that they actually take the blood pressure medicine every day at home, or the statin that they should be on, or aspirin, or whatever else preventive treatment they actually need? How do you make sure that the children who have asthma at home are actually getting the appropriate care at school so that they don't need to be taken out? Those are all the types of things. They're very complex problems. And I think that simply putting the responsibility on the worker in many ways, which seems to be the trend in which we're being pushed, may or may not really get us where we need to go. So what I would encourage us to think about, particularly when look, looking at that, is to try to understand, again, based on data, where are those pain points for the workforce? Let's, again, be systematic about it. Is it that you're losing um, your young um, uh, workers who are very productive um, because they feel that it's incompatible with family life? Think about that as a specific problem. Is it, in fact, middle-aged workers? And what you might be coping with, for whatever reason, is a substantial prevalence of mental health issues. If those issues then create policies that are specifically oriented to help people get there. So I think what I think about here, again, is let's follow the data about the data. And actually, I would encourage corporations and us to be partners rather than simply giving responsibility away. Wonderful. Thanks. David? Uh, I, I, so I have to sort out four different groups. And the first group would be if, you know, if you're a provider, a healthcare provider, uh, organizationally, um, th we're still in a system where the incentives are aligned to fix problems, not to help people live healthier, happier, uh, more well lives. Um, so it's difficult as a provider to make ends meet, to have a good, bot strong bottom line, and not be sort of lured in or sucked into the uh, fee-for-service um, orientation that still, still exists. So to those providers, I would say the things that you can do to compete and get more value-based um, uh, medicine uh, purchasing from the payers is, is to be able to, to post your outcomes, not just your disease-oriented outcomes of survival or whether you re reverse the, the, the clinical indicators of a disease, but how are people functioning? Are they able to stay fully employed? Are they able to, to, to lead fully functional lives? Post that, compete with your, with your, your other providers um, in, you know, in, the, in the open space, um, use the social, social uh, network 
to show your outcomes are better than, than the competition. Um, and, and by doing that, you're, you're going to become naturally incentivized to help people live more, more healthy, um, you know, fit lives and eat better and, and, and take care of them, themselves in terms of substance use and other uh, social issues. Um, if you're a payer, or you work for a, you know, a, um, a payer of health care, uh, there I would say press, press the providers to focus more on the long-term view, the wellness view, uh, because a lot of payers, particularly from the employer base, are, are interested in people for the short period of time that they work in that industry and in, in their particular organization. So if someone's going to get sick 10, 20 years from now and the usual turnover in a, in a, in a company is six or seven years, well, why should you care about that? Um, because you know, the, by the time they get sick and are going to cost you a lot, they're going to be working for somebody else or maybe retired. Uh, that's a really backward way to think, but it is still the way th the system tends to be driven. And if, if you're uh, an employer now, um, I, I would say you know, there is a lot to be gained, not just on health and wellness, but in, in retention of, of your employees by providing incentive, incentive programs for living a healthy lifestyle and doing things to create an environment where people can, um, you know, where people can make healthy choices uh, because of what you make available to them and don't have food deserts in your own work environment, but have healthy food choices available, as an example. Finally, because uh, I think there are a lot of you out there, if you're a company that, you know, that's a technology company that is in the health space or wants to get in the health space, please help us. You know, I work in a healthcare system, a healthcare delivery system, and we're way behind um, technology generally in terms of our ability to use the social social media, to use technology-enabled health care. Electronic health record companies have not, I'm sorry if any of you work for EHR companies, they have not done a good job of, of promoting um, interoperability, looking across different, uh, different um, health care plans or, or providers. Uh, in fact, they have they've really tried to kind of corner their, their, their market. And, and so it hasn't helped. It's very difficult to get good quality technology-enabled health care out of a, the most existing um, electronic health records. So those of you who have companies, and I, I've seen some on the, on the program um, that are in that space, please enable this activity within those, within those electronic health records because most providers won't go to a second system. The patients might on their own, but I can tell you from our experience trying to engage patients in healthcare, we're, we're, we're successful with about one in five. Four out of five patients don't participate, even when we make it possible for them, actively in sort of the self-management and self-monitoring of uh, what's, what's so important in managing most chronic uh, diseases and conditions. That's great to hear. I've taken notes. I'm on the board of Willis Towers Watson. And Eric, if you're still in the room, we need to make sure someone talks to, talks to Dave here. There you are. Wonderful. I Thanks. want to talk to you, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, if, we're, if we're running organizations today, we are dealing with many generations of workers. And the majority of people who are making decisions on these issues are people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, let's say 50s and 60s, people in their best of health, 62. Um, what thoughts do you guys have on these incoming generations of workers and their mindset on the issue of wellness and how healthy are they? Um, just because you guys talk to all kinds of people. So any, any thoughts on that? Anyone? I'll go real quick on okay. that. Just to mix it up a little bit. <laughs> there you go. Um, millennials are actually the healthiest generational group. Um, they just naturally are, uh, take better care of themselves. I'm not sure why, uh, and I'm not sure if it'll last, but that is a very um, healthy um, age cohort. Uh, and so I would, I would capitalize on it. They're also, they also happen to be fairly tech savvy, so able to use many of the tools that are available to them uh, to you know, coach or encourage you know, healthier behaviors. Uh, so I would say you know, identify leaders in the sort of millennial age bracket and, and move them up um, in the system for you know, uh, encouraging some of us older um, you know, less, more resistant uh, types to, to come along. And I'm not sure about those coming out of, you know, coming out of college now. Uh, we, I'd be very curious to see what they're like, you know, in terms of how m immersed from birth they are in technology yeah. and how so much of their social network is from the comfort of their own bedrooms um, on, uh, you know, on gaming online with, with friends. So that'll be, uh, yeah. that'll be interesting to see. <laughs> Uh, I'd say that, um, that when we look at um, individuals and they look healthy, 
that may or may not necessarily give us the information we need. So we talked about millennials. Yes, it's true that they, um, they don't get heart attacks and strokes and things like that, but there are significantly high rates of, of social isolation, disconnection, unsafe sexual behavior, substance use, um, attempted suicide, eating disorders. I mean, you can go down that list. So it's very important for us to actually, again, really understand what the issues are. And it varies. Decade by decade, the problems that you deal with will change. Just as we all mature, the types of issues we get will be very different. So I think part of it is um, that um, the, as a senior executive, whether you're in a health system or an employer, is to at least have some appreciation of what those things are that you're going through. If all of the people you hang out with are 50 or 60 somethings, you're just gonna think that, oh, you know, the world is all about, you know, eating healthy and how do I make sure that I don't get musculoskeletal pain from my golf swing and sprains in my lower back. That's a very different series of problems than if you're, when you're 20s you, you think about and your 30s as well. So I think again, letting the data guide you and take a minute to become educated about well, what, uh, what is the prevalence of these types of conditions. It's very surprising when you look at the data about how much you might be missing. And then again, then think about tailoring the interventions, whether at the workplace or technology, to specifically address where those unmet needs really are. That's wonderful. As we, as we wrap up, I'm gonna ask you for one thought apiece on personal advice for everyone in this room. If there was one thing that we should all be doing, what's the kind of one thing that you would recommend more than anything else? Moving. <laughs> Activity. Yeah. Maybe more than just walking with the Fitbit, although walking's good. Yeah. Um, but you know, get your heart rate up, 20, 30 minutes. And then, and then to, to what Darshak had pointed out earlier, if you get in, re in a regular routine of doing that, don't automatically eat more. Because <laughs> if, if, if you do that, you're gonna be very disappointed because you won't lose weight. <laughs> very good, thank you. Darshak, um, I'd say, I I'll take a quick story. Uh, many of you may be aware that President Bill Clinton um, uh, had a heart attack uh, some years ago. And uh, he, at the time, um, you know, married to Hillary Clinton, some of the most well-informed people around, very well-connected. Uh, and when he actually um, underwent, it turned out he had to undergo cardiac bypass surgery. He, uh, he had surgery done at a hospital in New York. Um, and it turned out that um, he actually went, at that time, New York City, and New York State, in fact, was actually reporting surgeon-specific risk-adjusted cardiac vascular mortality. That's a fancy way of saying that you could go online and find a report card of what surgeons' patients survive the best. Oh. Uh, many states actually do this, by the way. It's publicly available. Uh, and he actually went to the surgeon at the center that had the highest risk-adjusted mortality and actually saw the surgeon who also had the highest risk-adjusted mortality. Statistically significant. So one could argue that um, if even the former leader of the free world can't really uh, get access to data and have it inform him at the point of care, what hope is there for the rest of us? So what are the challenge I'd leave for you is that these sources of data are out there. When you are undergoing these procedures, if you have, for example, a loved one who's about to have a baby, you can actually, in the state of Massachusetts where I live, you can actually go online and see risk-adjusted rates of cesarean, avoidable cesarean section delivery. Think about how you currently choose where you go for your health care. You talk to your friends, you talk to your family. There is data that can actually guide you. From the standpoint of actually improving quality and value, it is critical that this data actually informs the everyday decisions we make. So what I'd encourage my thought here is that when you have a significant healthcare decision to make, go out there and use what's out there. And if it is not helpful to you, or it is in a form that is terrible or imp impossible to understand, use the considerable talents that you have to actually make that better. Again, if you can't do it, what help is there for the rest of us? And increasingly, if it's gonna be our jobs to look out for our health, we need to make it easier for everybody to make the right decisions. May I ask a quick question? Um, I know you're trying to wrap up, but- No, it's okay. Um, just a show of hands, how many of you, whether or not it's in health, how many of you work with big data, machine learning, something in that, something in that space? So a fair number, I, th I thought that would be the case. And yet, you know, the, the tools for, for analyzing big data are, are still very primitive. How many of you are working in analytics with, I know Optum is, so a, small, a smaller number. I think there's, that's where there's a real need is figuring out, we have so much data. Yeah. Figuring out, whether it's in health or in, in any field, figuring out what to do with all of that data is, um, is still a, um, it's in its infancy. Right, yeah. thank you so much. I, you know, I, 
learned a lot from this, that 30 minutes. Um, data, follow the data that tells you about the data. That's actually very important. And one of the challenges we have is there's so much out there. Sifting through it and figuring out what's the important, what's the correct, and then making it right. If we are in a position to make it right, make it right. That's very powerful. Um, something else I learned, look forward to the age of 62. I'm looking forward <laughs> um, And all it's cracked up to be. But. <laughs> <laughs> what are the pain points for your workers? That's a very powerful comment. Um, and it reminds me of Jonathan Chen's comment this morning about being an empathetic leader. And how many of us, whether we're colleagues or leaders, don't take the time to understand what are the pain points for people, what's causing people pain, and therefore, how do we modify policies and, and the way we work with one another to help one another through those pain points. Um, I think that's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Great to be on the stage with you, Darshak. Nice to meet you.